Okay. So we're going to be talking about securing OpenStax underside. I'm Eric Windish. I am a principal engineer at Cloud Scaling and lead of OpenStack development. I've been developing since Cactus, doing uh, platform as a service since 2002, infrastructure as a service since 2006, and was engineering lead for KT's second generation uh, block storage, which doesn't actually really apply to uh, this talk very much. So good news is uh, we're the last session of the day, and I only have 40 slides. So we're going to probably finish up a little early, <laughs> and then you can all go home or uh, drink some beers. So we want to accept that we will fail to secure our applications, and we have to secure the, un the architecture underneath. There's a lot of things that we can do to improve the security of OpenStack itself. As best we can, we have to assume that we will fail to do that. There's a certain amount of risk in, in that. Yeah, I already said that. Okay, even faster. Uh, tenant escalation. We accept that someone will succeed in gaining more rights than they should in our applications. They must not be able to break the infrastructure. We have obvious vectors. Users are going to be able to get in some ways, uh, API. Uh, actually, not necessarily any strict way they get into the API, just that it's very public facing, so it's a pretty obvious vector. RPC is pretty bad. Database is pretty bad. We have potential for ring escalation, and uh, root wrap is uh, actually a, pr a pretty nasty vector as well because it does sudo, and we do a bunch of stuff as root. So this is how messaging is. It's just uh, everything communicates to everything, and there's no restrictions on that. So we can, and we execute code based on input received from the network, uh, from the database and the messaging bus. Uh, this is unsigned and clear text. There's no roles or authorization done on any of this. You can't just secure that with TLS or SSL because that only gives you security to Rabbit and it's not, it's still untrusted uh, over the network. And, well, I guess in Rabbit and Q itself and potentially you have man in the middle attacks as well. The database, some of our database is actually done over messaging, which we just evaluated is not yet secure. And the database uses passwords. Uh, there's no PKI used. Uh, MySQL and Postgres both support uh, certificates, PKI. We don't use it. There's no capability in OpenStack to use that. They could, should, and will hopefully use PKI eventually. There's the intentional limited escalation that we do in root wrap. So we need to do things with escalated privileges. That's done as root. It's not done with system capabilities. Uh, the input usually originates from the database or the message queue, which again are not secure. Uh, we do use sudo to filter the input, uh, no granular stuff. And <laughs> we can break the hypervisor, we can have ring escalation. You get jerks like this that go in the mortar and climb up the mountain and throw the ring in and uh, break stuff really badly for us. Yeah, can't trust those hobbits. Make your network secure and assume it isn't. You have out-of-band attacks, people coming in over your VPN and it's not terminated at the right place or maybe they, there's no firewall or they get through it, whatever the case might be. Uh, using DNS is a risk of man-in-the-middle attacks and all sorts of nasty things. Uh, don't use DNS or use DNSSEC. Um, it's actually not that hard to not use DNS. Uh, it's kind of hard to use DNSSEC. Uh, you should use it. Um, there's good reasons to use DNS, but if you're going to use it, do it right. SDN can be compromised and somebody can reconfigure your network. That's kind of a scary thing. Uh, I know people are, want to try and prevent that from happening. So the whole point here is that we want to accept our failure to do all of these things. We'd like to do all those things. We may not be able to. Um, some things that we can't fix 
or presume that we will not be able to fix at all our, our supply chain. Uh, maybe the government can do that because we can't necessarily trust that somebody is not going to do something at your vendor. Uh, someone in your transport, customs, uh, your postal services, FedEx, uh, ship, shipping and receiving, anyone at any of these vendors, uh, people who could design your CPUs, your systems integrators, motherboard designers, uh, BIOS, UE, if I, uh, developers, router designers, manufacturers, developers, switch designers, South Bridge designers, NIC designers, manufacturers. <laughs> you have to trust all of these people. If you use text, if you use Secure Boot, you use uh, TPMs, all of these things can circumvent that. And unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, it'd be nice if we could. I mean, there are some, maybe some extreme things you can do to prevent it, but at the moment, it'd be great if we can fix these problems, but we can't. So we have to accept that we're going to fail here. Uh, firmware compromise is something we can actually kind of do a little bit more about, but it's still pretty bad. Ethernet controllers in particular are kind of vulnerable. In January, there was an Intel EEPROM failure where you could actually kill network controller firmware or, or kill the network controller over the network by sending it a magic packet. And it practically affected most of the Intel controllers out there today. And that was really, really bad. And that's only one step away from an overflow that would have actually allowed you to overwrite the firmware over the network. And then all your text and all of your secure boot stuff in TPM is useless. So what we can do to the best of our ability is to secure the underside. Uh, and to do that, we need to secure our boot process and our installation. Uh, so this slide might be in the wrong place, but we want to probably talk about who wants to trust a little bit. We want users to trust their provider and their provider systems. Providers do not trust their users. You don't. If you're a provider, if you're whomever is public provider, HP, Rackspace, uh, Datafort, any of these public providers that are coming out, Bluehost is a new one. You don't want to trust your users. They're just people that give you a credit card. Users do want to provide uh, trust their provider, or unfortunately they have to, um, or presume that they have to, uh, but the trust doesn't go both ways. So we need to convey trust. Uh, because the systems want to, tr the providers want to trust their systems, you need to use attestation, uh, measure the state of your system, uh, verified by remote systems. You want to, for the provider to the user, you need to have transparency, effective communication, Third-party auditing, uh, cloud audit kind of fits in there, potentially. And effective communication to users may actually also include attestation. Uh, unfortunately, to do any of that for the user, we need, as a provider, as someone building a cloud and deploying a cloud, we need to actually trust those systems that we've built and we've designed and we're deploying. So we can do that through text, and we can do that through UEFI Secure Boot, uh, in, unless you're using ARM, and then it's whatever they use on ARM, or uh, AMD for that matter. So to take measurements, we, we can do it two ways. We can measure, then execute, or we can execute, then measure. And uh, both are gonna be useful, but one, we, we, we boot up, your UEF, UEFI measures your bootloader, you execute the bootloader, your bootloader measures your kernel, and then your bootloader executes your kernel. Or the other way around where you execute in the measure, so after you've done all that and you've executed this code, you can actually verify after the fact that you've executed good code using TXT, uh, which TXT, uh, you do an SNR command, that performs a soft CPU reset and it takes a measurement, and you can attest that with a remote service. And it's important to note that neither of this actually verifies your data, it verifies and measures your, your executables. So you have to actually trust that your executables themselves that you trust are verifying the data that they're using. And this is sort of a, an example, this is actually from Intel, and it kind of shows measure and then execute, and then you'd use TXT on the other side, and 
could be a little bit better, but you would then verify and report that and att attest that. So on one hand, you ensure you don't execute the bad code, and on the other, you verify you didn't execute the bad code, and both are desirable. You don't want to, there are some that will say you can just do the verification, you can just uh, use a dynamic root of trust and verify that you haven't uh, executed bad code, and there is definitely value in doing that, but I'm of the opinion that one should never really execute code that they don't trust in the first place. Uh, it's great to verify it after the fact, but you really, as best as possible, never execute it. So trusting your systems means trusting the software it runs, and assuming that we trust all the firmware. So we're going to do this through a secure unintended installation. Uh, you can't, whatever software that you're running has to be installed. You can't trust that software unless you can trust the installation of that software. And that starts all the way back at your bootloader. So this is how you would do a Pixie boot, typically. Your system boots up, it loads the, the BIOS or the UEFI. You boot from Pixie. Pixie gets an IP address off of BootP and a TFTP server to download an image. You download all this stuff over the, the network, which for the sake of argument, we'll presume is untrusted and has been potentially compromised. You download the bootloader, you execute the bootloader. The bootloader downloads the kernel from TFTP, executes it, the kernel downloads the file system uh, in an RD file that contains your installation uh, media or medium and loads it and executes code that's in that file system. We depend too greatly on network security. If your network is not secure, if somebody has compromised the hypervisor and has compromised your network infrastructure, you cannot securely install and incentize new systems in your cloud. And the systems that you incentize cannot be trusted to be secure. So, this is an example of something we'd like to try and do, which is to do a secure installation. And your BIOS UEFI, uh, UEFI uh, has a Pixie ROM, or uh, it's actually really an uh, EFI uh, piece of code that runs in UEFI. It's signed and trusted. Uh, actually, probably part of your UEFI installation already when you get the system, so uh, you're kind of good there. That's going to download, uh, get information from BootP, which is untrusted, which is okay because when we download that bootloader from TFTP, it's signed. And that signature is verified against a key in the TPM, a public key in the TPM. And only after we have verified the signature do we execute that bootloader. And then that bootloader will download the kernel and download the file system, your in RD, verify the signatures on those, and then execute them. And by doing this, you ensure that no one who has access to your TFTP server or your boot, key, uh, boot P server or anywhere else in your network can actually bring up systems running your software in your cloud or bring up any other system running in your cloud as long as your UEFI on each system is configured with your keys and no one else's keys and it's configured for secure boot. Uh, which uh, is important because then you do, uh, just to let you know, you do need to have vendor support. Uh, in general, if you're doing this at scale, you'll have to have your vendors remove Microsoft's keys, first of all, uh, and install your uh, public key into the uh, SKS, in the, in, in the hardware. And by doing that, you can make sure that only your code can actually be booted on those physical machines that are in your data center. Uh, it should also be noted here that the kernel, is a, it's an interesting deficiency in Linux. Uh, the kernel cannot actually verify the inner RD itself, 
which is why uh, some of the ability to, for instance, bootload directly into the Linux kernel from UEFI can't be used here. And you need to use a bootloader that can actually verify the file system for you because Linux cannot. Uh, there's just no feature. Maybe uh, Matthew Garrett can help with that. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Uh, Pixie, network install. So your, your hardware supports it, secure boot can verify the bootloaders, uh, but doesn't verify, so we kind of went over that already. But, right, so it doesn't, whoa. it doesn't verify the data, so you need to have a bootloader, you have to download a bootloader that actually can verify that in RD. And the only one out there today that seems to fulfill these promises is iPixie, uh, used to be formerly known as gpixie or etherboot. So you may have heard of any of these projects, they're all the same thing. Uh, yay, renaming. Uh, another thing is it doesn't do PCR injection uh, for TXT, which is kind of unfortunate. So you do have to then just trust iPixie did the right thing and the signature for, for iPixie. It, you still do maintain your chain of trust, but you do have a little bit extra trust in IPix you might not have if it could do PCR injection. I believe that someone is working on adding that feature. Uh, so I should also add that if you're using Chef or Puppet, whatever you're downloading and installing from Chef or Puppet should also be signed or downloaded through SSL. And packages should also be fixed. So sign your, have you signed packages? If you're using Ubuntu and Red Hat and so forth, it's generally okay. If you're building your own packages, make sure that you sign those packages and you're actually having those verified and you're not circumventing that stuff and you're not just use, you, you can use self-signed key, keys as long as you actually uh, put your certificate on those servers and in your installation process and don't just tell it to bypass the, uh, the signature checks. And do not ever trust PyPI. It is bad. There is no verification of the signatures in PyPI. You, you can upload signatures for your packages, but it doesn't verify it when you install with PIP. So most people, pro I, I doubt many people are actually doing installations of OpenStack using PIP. And, but if you are, someone can do a man in the middle attack on you pretty easily. It's kind of ugly. So uh, there's actually a couple slides here on this. And these are just some tools. If you download the slide deck, you can use these links. I have some information on doing this stuff in QEMU and downloading iPixie if you want to do this without actually having a whole bunch of specialized hardware. Uh, yeah, we're hiring. So come work at Cloud Scaling. So as I promised, we'd finish early. I was just about right, we're at 18 minutes, I thought it'd be about 20. And I'll open the floor for questions, comments. Uh, please walk to the microphone if you can. Or not. Questions? None? Yay, we get to go home. <laughs> so during your presentation, I thought it was very interesting methods you were proposing for a, a secure and verifiable boot chain. You made it all sound very easy. Why isn't everybody doing that? It's very, very hard. <laughs> <laughs> you, this is one of those, those security topics where it's really easy to tell people what to do. It's much harder to do it. Uh, the, the biggest problem here, unfortunately, is going to be to work with your vendors and get your keys into the systems and get Microsoft's keys removed. <laughs> and, but once you do that, yes, there's gonna be engineering work to get everything signed first of all and to do it. Uh, also, another important thing is a lot of this stuff is pretty new. And a lot of the work only in the last one or two years by people like uh, Matthew Garrett, uh, of Nebu at, now at Nebula, formerly of Red Hat, really enabled a lot of these things to even be possible. So, Hopefully, in the next uh, one to two years, we'll see a lot more adoption of these techniques. We talked the other day. Um, th th there's a lot of barriers 
Um, beyond that, you know, the TPMs are generally not provisioned with any, any certificates or keys in them. And, yes. uh, and, it's, uh, and, and provisioning TPMs on, on a large scale is incredibly difficult because of this. It's, it's just a very manual process to enable them. Microsoft does it. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't. They don't come with, uh, their TPMs are not turned on by default because it, it, it's a manual, and, and they don't come with um, uh, the certificates and everything burned into the TPM from the factory. Because that's something that the, the, the box maker has to do, the board maker has to do. And it's, um, there were privacy r reasons. I, I believe if you're running Windows 8, uh, those systems have to, they may be run in permissive mode, m many of them, but yeah. they have to have secure boot uh, on those systems. Secure for boot may be on there, but I don't yeah. know how, how extensively they're using the TPM uh, to, as part of the verified process, other than as perhaps maybe just a key store. Well, the, the SKS is seeded with Microsoft's key. So right. now granted, not everybody's Microsoft, not everybody can do that. But if you have a good vendor relationship with somebody like Quanta, right. uh, you can get this. But not done. every device has a TPM either. They, they're doing it without, so on some devices without a TPM. I'm pretty sure. Don't think that's possible. Um, now, some of the TPMs now are, are in processor, I believe. Uh, but yeah, but it, I, I agree that the hardware part is the hardest piece of this. Well, uh, the, 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 the getting systems and, and uh, the keys in your, in your hardware, that's the hardest part. Absolutely. Remote attestation is also a big challenge. Uh, I mean, it's one it thing to verify, but then to actually have a, you know, because then it requires a PKI infrastructure and, and you know, sure. the, the knowledge. Yeah, so I, I didn't want to get too much into the application layer uh, beyond this. Uh, and there is things like OATS uh, that are now integrate with OpenStack. Right. And one can look at that. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's conceptually, it's a really good idea. It's, it's but the challenge is going to be implementing it. Sure. All the way up. Thank you. Brian Payne. Brian Payne from Nebula. Um, I just wanted to say that we have been working um, quite hard on doing a lot of what you just described. Um, as mentioned, this is very non-trivial to do. Deployment is challenging, implementation is challenging. As we go down the path, it becomes increasingly clear that no one has really done it before because <laughs> the pieces look like they should fit together and they just don't. Yes. And so we're working very hard to fix them. But um, since we're talking about it today and this is an open source conference, I just wanted to put out there that if there's others that are working in this space, that are interested in this space, um, happy to collaborate, happy to, um, to discuss you know, how we can, as a community, make this kind of thing happen more frequently. So. Thank you. Uh, if there's no more questions, then I think we can break. Awesome. Thank you.